I hope you guys uh, see the journey I was talking about earlier, right? I think this, the CIO of Target laid it out pretty clearly. There's a lot of different ways to look at your business and to think about how you can take steps to either move to the cloud or develop a new process to give your engineers the tools they need to go wild and innovate. Um, I want to give you a couple logos that aren't doing that. These are all companies that are either going out of business, have gone out of business, um, or are just not, they're barely making it, right? So nobody wants to do or be uh, forgotten. No company, nobody wants to work for an organization that goes under. And I think technology has reached a place, cloud technology has reached a place, where that is the ultimate differentiator. And it becomes the ultimate differentiator when you realize technology isn't about who's got what, because you could have AWS, you could have Google, you could have Azure. It's about who's got the ideas and the talent and the ingenuity to use what you have to transform your organization, right? And Google historically, which we'll talk about very quickly, has historically been ahead. A lot of competitors write research papers. They understand the tech, they understand the future, they see the vision, but they don't execute on it. Google's brought more technology to market for the enterprise that's been able to encapsulate radical transformation um, than I'd argue the comp competition. They may have been around longer, but they haven't taken the ideas that are in their head and put them to the pavement in the same way. Um, Sears is a good case study for this. You know, I think I like to talk about Sears. I'm going to pick on them for a little bit. I know you, you may not be in retail, um, but thinking from a business standpoint, whether you're brick and mortar, a small AI startup, a tech company, it doesn't matter. Uh, what, it, what it comes down to is how you think about your business and the resources you have. Sears had 89,000 employees. I worked for a startup once that had 15 employees, and it was a moment where if we don't fix something, we don't do something, the company goes under. They had 89,000 employees, and I can guarantee that they never had a massive company-wide stand-up. No, you've, had, you've probably been in a stand-up at your, your startup. You know, like, guys, okay, we're gonna pull in the product people, we're gonna pull in marketing, we're gonna pull in the janitor. I, wanted, I want ideas, I need, I need something to keep this boat afloat. Sears didn't do that, they had 89,000 brains. What happened? IT employees, they had 1,500 IT employees. It's pretty average for a company of that size, but 15, that's enough to staff a company that's a SaaS company that's well into the six or seven billion dollar range. You know, they're, they're making up, I don't want to name any names, but there are software companies that have that number of employees and they're making eight, nine, ten billion dollars um, and they're innovating and they're changing the world. So you have 1,500, 1500 brains that are specifically IT. You also have $334 million. That's enough money to raise a seed round for a startup to then take on something as big as 15, 20,000 employees and transform an industry. So they had all the resources, they had all the manpower and the money. Um, they're, in an, they're in an industry that's, that's undergoing a lot of transformation and change, but what happened? I think it, it came down to not having the energy behind the ideas and not having the ideas. So these are all solutions they could have gone with to make themselves a little bit better than the competition, right? You could have had at least self-checkout, maybe a body scanning app. There's a, there's a startup I'm working with in San Francisco. They have spent less than a million dollars and developed a mobile application you could put on a stand. It'll scan you and then it'll take your measurement and match you with clothing. And then also, if you want, it'll print a little figure of yourself. So, million, less than a million bucks. I mean, I would go to a Sears store if I could like stand in a body scanner and like, you know, like I'm in the Jetsons and then get scanned and then know exactly what's out there that I want to buy. That'd be a fun experience. Or maybe style recommendations, or you could have done something like Target, like a drive up window. There's a lot of potential out there. And as a business, you always have to think about the potential. You have to understand and weigh the risks well, this is a really good idea. How much will it impact my business? How much risk is associated with it? But you also have to think of like the potential of what it could potentially do for your business, where it could take you, where it could take the whole industry you're in. Um, and so as we, as we think about that, where you're going, where you want to go, um, the way that you get there, we're going to look at technology next. And uh, the power, I'm going to skip that quote. But we're going to talk about business continuity and how to how to get there, how to continue going where you're going and ensure the ship doesn't run out 100 years from now. And Randy, do you want to come back up on stage? Cool. Excellent, thank you. Here's the point. Okay. So from a, um, 
Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. I have a, an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, and I have a, an MBA in finance. And I've been a product manager at Microsoft, HP. I've done architecting. Basically, I've been helping companies figure out how to create value with technology. And what has really drawn me to um, what Google is doing is what was mentioned in the discussion about Target. Now, he, he, he stated something that was really important from an architect's perspective. And maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't. But it's the abstraction away from the particulars of the hardware underneath. Right? You don't have to worry that your network card has serial number 43702 with a known problem. And you have to write software to adapt to that. All of that is taken care of. And that, that consumes an enormous amount of energy, having software developers worry about that kind of stuff. And when, when you look at what Google's doing, they've not only built a platform that has these abstractions, they're building upon those. And in a really interesting business model, releasing them. So they came up with MapReduce. They needed that for the kind of cloud processing that they were doing. So they wrote some papers, and they talked about MapReduce, what they were doing. And then that was released. And the open source community said, that's a cool idea. Why don't we write something called Hadoop? And that became a huge open source um, movement, really, in the industry. So Google you know, kind of kicked that off. And we're going to get back to networking. Um, it's up there to kind of remind me. But let's jump to containers. Google runs everything in a container. So a container is a lightweight computing context. And if you have questions about Docker and Kubernetes and you want to have an in-depth conversation, I'd be happy to go there. But the key thing is the difference between a virtual machine and a container, really from a business perspective, is a virtual machine will take one, two, five minutes to boot up. I mean, it's big. It's a big thing. All the software gets. You know, the hardware gets going, the emulated hardware, the operating system, all that gets started, then it gets wired together and starts running. A container is not a virtualization of hardware, it's a virtualization of the operating system. So it just kind of sits right on top of the operating system, and these will come to life in milliseconds. So it's like, poof, I need some containers to do some computing, now they're gone, I can wire them up, and you start seeing that that's really kind of a powerful thing. There's actually a lot of um, business implication of going to this technology because it truly decouples developers from the operators. A developer, when you're talking about building software that's released as a container, you build an image for this container and it's immutable. Once the developer develops it on their computer, because these things can run anywhere, you develop it on your computer, it runs, it passes all the tests, and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. You hand it off to an ops guy, and he says, well, given our load, we need to have five of these. We need to have more web servers and middleware and whatever. And you just say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire these things up. Well, that's a huge task. And so you want to take these containers and manage them. So Google has been doing this for over 10 years. Um, they call their system Borg. I went to a presentation uh, given by the first product manager for uh, Kubernetes. This was back when I was living in, in Colorado. And he put up a slide with the architecture of Borg. And he said, this is what Google does. This is how we run containers. Then the next slide came up. It was the same slide. The names were changed. And he said, this is Kubernetes. So Google took 10 years of intellectual property recoded it anew in the Go programming language, and released it open source. It's like, who takes your, you know, the gems? Who takes your key intellectual property and releases it open source? Well, a really interesting phenomenon happened. After that, I started, you know, would go to some user group meetings in Denver, and what I saw was companies were saying, whoa, this is cool. If we take our intellectual property and put it into Kubernetes, we get back the sum of the two. And other companies started doing that. So the whole thing started growing, and it's now an official separate uh, 
open source project with governance and all that. So let's get back, why would Google do that? Well, you can imagine from a business perspective, Google's saying, hmm, we know how to run containers, you know, there's a competitive landscape. What if everyone ran Kubernetes and we just ran it better? So, you know, you think about Google's in the business of selling compute, but they don't want to waste it, and we'll get back to that. So if it doesn't matter if you're on Amazon or Google or Azure or you know, some other place, and your containers are running, and they happen to run better or cheaper or whatever on Google, then that's the win, right? <clears throat> Machine learning, we'll get to that in a second, but I want to go back to networking. This is something that is not, there's a lot of stuff that's not discussed when you hear cloud presentations. It's like, well, what about the security chips on the, on the motherboard? What about all this stuff? Um, and networking, if, if, there, if I was to point out any secret sauce that Google has, and you'll, I don't think there are very many presentations you'll hear. It's the networking. They, I was told by a Googler, they throw away network equipment that's more of advanced than anything you can buy on the market. They're insane about the network. The bandwidth in a zone is um, five petabits per second by, you know, by section bandwidth. It's, it's fast, it's, it's abstracted, it's reliable, it all runs on Google Fiber that they put across the planet. It's encrypted, you know, it's like all these check boxes that you may want to have, and it's just there and it just works. And there's a demo that I like to give. Um, I didn't feel like I wanted to go into demo, um, de demo challenges here, but what I do is I'll bring up some virtual machines. And I'll bring up a virtual machine in Asia, in Europe, in the United States. How many of you know what ping is? Okay, you can ping, you send a packet, and you find out how long it takes to come back. And there's another utility called traceroute. Any, do you know what that is? So what that does is it sends a ping packet, but it says only go to the first hop, fail, and come back. And then it sends it, go two hops, fail, and come back. And the, when it comes back, the packet reports where it got to. So traceroute is a way to figure out what is the pathway between you and say CNN.com? All right, you can use that. You can put it runs on Windows. It'll run on your Linux or your Mac, and you can start figuring out what the network looks like. So I, I do this demo where I put these three machines up and running, and they're globally distributed, but they're on what looks like a local area network. Right. So that's kind of the first mind twister. It's like okay, local area network, but it's global. And then I do pings, and it's reasonable. You know, you can't go any faster than the speed of light. But then I do a trace route. So I go from, the, you know, in a virtual machine, I go outside, again, to maybe Target or something like that. You can see that it's going through a lot of hops. Then I do a trace route between this machine and the one in Europe, one hop. So it looks like a TCP IP network, but underneath, it's actually a software-defined network that runs on a completely different technology. It actually uses something called a CLOS uh, design that was originated by Bell Labs back in the 50s when they were doing telephone switch design. So that's what Google has underneath. And the point of drilling on this is that when you move to the cloud, sometimes you need a 180 degree shift in your thinking. And sometimes you can just take stuff and just move it up there and it's, it's going to run. You'll hear a presentation uh, a little bit later in which um, you'll hear that there are tools that can assess what's going on and help you just kind of take what you've got here and move it up to the cloud. Um, what I find is that a lot of our customers want to take that as a first step. Remember Tyler was talking about what are the steps that you could take to safely, you know, safely from a business context, identify the risks, figure out what the reward's going to be, and you know, take these steps to go to the cloud. Well, a lot of companies will move things just as they are, and I really don't like the term, but lift and shift. And then once you're up there, you can spin the dial and get more horsepower, you can get more throughput, you, you know, leave a, alleviate a lot of the pressures that you got uh, if you're in a, your own data center. And then it opens up. Then you've got all these cloud services, one of which is machine learning. And it may sound like kind of an esoteric thing, 
Um, but at Dido, we've got several certified data engineers. So we're, we're very knowledgeable about building models. Um, we could you know, give you a presentation on how we have used it to help uh, customers um, improve their business flow and make you know, decisions. And you can just kind of embed it wherever you want to embed it. OK, so let me go back here. Now, I hope you're thinking about ways that you might be able to use these things in your own um, business, and we can talk about them later. So here are some things that are really only possible on the cloud. So once you get to scale, so you have to you know, think about how does Google think about compute? If you look at a data center, you know those long rows of computers and disks, Google, you know, somebody at Google will step back and say, that is a computer, right? The data center is a computer. It's, in, a, in a sense, it is. I mean, what is a computer? It's just processing and storage connected together. And so you can have it you know, on one machine on a motherboard, or you can have it connected by you know, cables or fiber optics or whatever you want. It really is, from an architectural perspective, just one big computer. And when you have that scale, you can do things like BigQuery. So BigQuery is a system designed to inhale data. So it'll run at, in a minimum, a terabyte a second of just inhaling data. And if you know, any, if you know about hard disks and how fast they go, you can't do that with a single disk. So this, the, what you do, the big, best way to think about this is you take massive amount of data, you take a SQL query, you throw it at the data, and Google will spin up 500, 1,000, or 2,000 machines to process that query. It'll just inhale all the data, process it, and then deliver the results. And you're just renting it for the, you know, the time that you need to process that. Um, it's, there's a kind of a curious way they bill for that. They don't bill for the CPU. They bill for the number of bytes you read off disks. Um, and that's another thing to, to get used to in the cloud is, you know, where does your money go? And that's kind of my other job besides architect, excuse me, <clears throat> architecting is I focus on saving everybody money because I, I know a lot of the tricks and how you can do things slightly differently to save money. PubSub, um, great architectural element for decoupling your system. And it'll take a million messages per second. Dataflow is actually map, they don't like to hear it described as MapReduce version 2. But at Google, they don't use MapReduce anymore. They use Dataflow. So Dataflow is a system that will seek out enough processing and flow your data through a bunch of nodes, each of which can do map, reduce, filter, join, aggregate, or something like that. And you literally just pull that together across the cloud, and you get massive throughput. Um, let's see, data proc. Oh, huh. this, how many of you use Hadoop? Not, OK, so uh, really briefly, Hadoop is a system where you can have lots of processors, and they'll crunch through your data, but you need to move the data out to those nodes. It'll crunch it and send the, send the information back. Because the network at Google is so fast, has such high bandwidth, they stream the data live to the processing node so they can scale up a Hadoop cluster or shrink it as it's running. And you, you, know, you can't do that unless you have a cloud. OK, this is showing the Jupyter network underneath everything. And then there are those other parts of the network, the VPN, load balancing, your private cloud that you have inside the cloud, interconnect, and cloud router. So these are all designed to support the network in the cloud and to connect to your own cloud if you want to maintain you know, on-premise or uh, have periodic connections or full-time connections. Underneath everything is something called Colossus Storage. So kind of like Ju the Jupyter Network, this isn't discussed very much. But this is a global storage system that Google has designed. And they just surface it in various ways. Big Table, which is a, a big table. Uh, cloud Storage is your buckets. Cloud SQL. Spanner is, how many of you are relational database aficionados? One, OK. I'll talk to you. I don't want to, I'll, I'll drill into Spanner with you later. Um, but these are different ways of organizing your data for persistence. And fundamentally, they're all based on the same underlying storage system, which is redundant and you know, geo-multi-located and encrypted and, and so on. For me, this is the most important slide of today. So what this is saying 
is that you can make a decision about where the boundary is for responsibility. So in green, I've labeled this Google responsibility, and in yellow, it's user responsibility. And right now, if you, were have, if you own your own data center or rent a data center, you're basically responsible for most of it, if not all of it. But now you have a choice. You could center yourself and say, I want to reduce my operational costs. I want to reduce the amount of money I spend on staff worrying about this. Then you go to Compute Engine. These are virtual machines. And you don't have to worry about the stack underneath. Google builds the stack from the circuit board up. They've got security chips that, as it's powering up, they make sure the BIOS is correct, they decrypt that, they run the next part of the stack, they decrypt that. You know, they engineer for security all the way up. And because they have that whole stack, there's a really cool feature where you're running your Linux box or your Windows box, and if they need to do maintenance, they can move your, your operating system and all your applications to other hardware, fix this, and then move it back, and you never know. So you don't get those calls. You know, I'm about, I need to take your server down because I need to do some patching. And that's because they have designed the whole stack. So there's a lot of ways where you can save on operational cost if you pick this. If you go to Kubernetes, managing your Docker containers, you, you choose a different line of responsibility. You're saying, hey, Google, you take care of more stuff. You know, they will patch the underlying parts of Kubernetes. They'll live update it and so on and your context of responsibility is now smaller. So you can focus on what's the value out of the code that you put in there. If you go to App Engine, there's zero DevOps. I have taught App Engine classes to companies that have made the strategic decision to hire developers who only write code that makes them money. Like down Phoenix, I was teaching an accounting software company. And they told me, we have picked App Engine because every developer is writing accounting code. Nobody worries about scaling, any of that stuff. Google takes care of all of that. And if you want to go even beyond that, there's cloud functions. So the way I think about this is you take some JavaScript or Python, and you kind of toss it to the cloud and say, when a certain event occurs, run this code. So you didn't have to worry about servers, right? They just they take care of all of that. So that you can make that choice. You know, maybe you want more control, maybe you're comfortable at this level, maybe you want to be up at Cloud Functions level. Um, there's some really uh, cool stuff that's going to be coming out uh, in the next couple of months around Cloud Functions that it's going to kind of blow your mind. You're going to be able to build systems that are, uh, you know, support iOS, uh, Android, websites, and it ha does server processing, but there's no server anywhere. The cloud is the server. So that's really getting away from having to worry about any kind of details. Okay, so to give me a break and to pass it on to Tyler, who has super passion about this, we're going to pass the baton. Cool. Hey guys, hear me? Testing? Great. So um, talking about machine learning, I know there's a few startups here that are looking at how to leverage AI, and I think I talked to a few of you about TensorFlow. And at the moment, you said you know, you're just looking at this for experiments or uh, low-level work. So there's three categories of machine learning capabilities, I like to categorize them this way, uh, that Google has. And some of it's competitors, but I think Google has definitely an edge on the APIs that are available. You, know, you have TensorFlow, your cloud machine learning. This is what you would leverage if you're a data scientist to build custom models from the ground up and then to run those models, right? Run experiments. There's a lot of other tools out there as well. And there's something that recently came out, I'm not sure if you've ever used this before, but Cloud Auto ML. So this is a fun, really interesting tool. Cloud Auto ML, if you've never heard of it before, was released just last year. And it's a tool set that allows you to take the power of TensorFlow and cloud machine learning, and then also uh, take the power of the pre-built APIs and mix and mold them together. So what Google says on its website is, um, Build a custom model without writing a single line of code. Well, it doesn't make sense. I mean, custom, but it's code. I don't understand. That's where cloud machine and uh, cloud auto ML come into being. So um, that's, that's the middle segment. If you're like a developer or if you're learning to be a data scientist, this is a great place to live and to play in. 
And then last, the easiest thing to understand, I'd say, is the ML perception services, right? These are all your APIs. These are things like vision API, um, text-to-speech API, um, visual recognition. These are my favorite things to talk about because you can get really creative there. There was a customer that was trying to solve a business problem, and they were saying, you know, we want to cut our insurance costs down. I was like, okay, well, I don't work for Allstate, so I don't know how to really do that. But um, th th we had this conversation, and I was like, okay, I'm a technologist. You want to cut your insurance? Walk me through. What's your business? What do you do? So they're a scooter company. They do scooter rentals. Okay, and so I'm guessing you want the, the users to wear helmets? Is that the goal now? And they're like, exactly. How do we do that? I was like, <laughs> I'm not a psychologist, but let me think about this. So thought about it for a little bit, and we uh, came to a couple ideas. One of the ideas I, I can share with you, because I didn't go with it, but it's a really fun idea, is uh, the, the idea of using the, the Vision API in the mobile app. You take a picture of yourself as an end user, it recognizes the helmet, you write it to recognize the helmet, and then when it recognizes the helmet, you get a $2 discount. That's a pretty cool idea. And they, they were like, well, what if someone drives from Pasadena with a helmet just to take the picture? I'm like, no one's going to do that. $2? $2? Pasadena, that's like $12 in gas. So we had a back and forth, but we didn't arrive at a conclusion of using that idea. But that's the kind of creativity you can apply to business problems with these APIs. If you have a mobile app, if you have a challenge in your business, if you're trying to drive a user type of behavior, there's a thousand ways to look at it. Um, and using, using these APIs are just the very beginning. So that's one example. The other example I'd like to give is there's a technology that's called the Assistant. And this is uh, based on a variety of API services that Google's mashed into one. And this is what you see on your phone. This is what you see on the Google Home. It understands speech. It understands intents. It connects. It auto-connects to different things. Um, and there's a way to actually use these different APIs for your database and your application or your platform um, on, a, on a variety of levels. Working with a gaming company, they wanted to be able to scan the screen of the video game that the, press, per, the user's in, see where they were at in that level, and then also find related content on YouTube to, to tie back to that user. So as the person's going through the video game, rather than having to press pause, walk to their laptop, um, pull up the screen, search for a way to get through a problem, you know, they'd actually just have suggested content pop up live. That was with Vision API training. Just where they were in a level, you have all the levels, boom. And then it gives you those recommendations on connecting to YouTube. The assistant was involved in that. And uh, there's other things you can do with the Google Assistant. You can use it for voice to access your, your database. You know, hey, Siri, how many deals did I close? I mean, sorry, not Siri. Whoops. How, how, assistant, how, hey, Google, how, how many, uh, I'm an iPhone user. Uh, Google, how, how, many, how many sales did I close today? Uh, you closed four sales. Oh, that's great. OK. Um, what's my total revenue now for the month? And if you tie this back to your Oracle database or your Salesforce database, you can do these kind of queries just using your voice on the Google Home. There's an assistant SDK that's out there. And we've been having a lot of fun playing around with what you can connect that to. Um, you can connect it to your car, even if you want to get real clever in your car and you're a mechanic, you know, you can get in there and play around with the, 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 the motherboard. The other thing that I'd like to talk about is taking that idea of, of removing the keyboard and the mouse and making it just a better user experience to chat. So another thing that we're doing with the Assistant API, it's called Dialogflow. That's the version of the, the API that's a chat version. You can actually connect this to your database, your Salesforce database, Oracle database, what other databases you're using. And you can start running queries, searching for information, and accessing that data in a much more human way, rather than having to log into your database, navigate through the tabs, the sidebar, everything else that's overwhelming, and then find, and then run, and then do, and then it takes you five minutes to run a report. You just, you know, pick a logic, oops, sorry, pick a tree. You know, what do you want to do? You want to execute a workflow? Are you browsing? Are you want to browse a report? Uh, oops, keep pressing the wrong button. Browse a report. OK, you want to browse a report. What report? Uh, revenue report. OK, what database and revenue report? Salesforce. OK. Um, is it pre-populated or are you going to build one? Uh, I'm going to pre-populate pre it. Cool. And then, boom. Uh, do you want a pie chart or do you want a numbers graph? I want a pie chart. OK, boom. And it throws it up just in the chat, chat box just like this. And that's just using this kind of architecture. The input, right, and the actual data, the intent, the code, and then your database. And the external APIs that you might need to help you communicate with that database and run the full query. Um, very fun thing to do. And I think this is the most innovative uh, thing that Google has put out uh, along everything else, but a lot of people don't give credit to what's possible here. And I, I, I've used my words carefully because there's a lot of innovative stuff. And some people are like, chatbots, those are boring. But I think this is great because think about it. If, if you took this to the maximum, if you maybe do some more development around what these connectors can do 
And if you open up beyond Oracle and Salesforce, you could create a, a tech ecosystem where there's no more UI. Why, why would I want to have tabs, windows, pages? So why don't I just have this? Like, this is the whole application. That's it. And all you're, you're doing now as a, as a SaaS company is providing the ultimate service of your application. If you're an accounting company, well, what does an accounting software company do? Helps you check the books. Cool. Build that workflow in this box rather than 50 different windows or 12 different pages or you know, hour-long hour -long processes. Build it in the box. That's, that's the space you have now to visually explain what you're doing. It's a lot more easy to navigate. Old people can do it, young people, babies can do it. They can pick out my iPad and they can probably you know, hack your business. I'm just kidding. But th th this is the future. You know, 30 years from now, UI design, it's gonna just be the invisible hand, chatbots or voice. Um, and, and Google's breaking into this space much faster than AWS or Azure. So if you're thinking about product development, you're thinking about um, where to take your product next or how you can get a competitive edge against your, your, your current competition, um, think about, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but think about the invisible UI. Think about chatbots, voice. You know, if you wanna even get really creative and start using hands and, and um, you know, starting to navigate and use webcams to, to do that. We've done some work with clients on that as well. It's really fun. Uh, and, and then, you know, I'm gonna touch on this, this is the concluding slide. I think the beginning we talked about business and the journey a little bit, we touched on that. And then Randy talked about some of the tools. I briefly touched on the AI and this is the complete platform, but this is only a glimpse of the complete platform. Google has over 260 icons, hexagons now. I call them Tinker Toys because they're really like Tinker Toys, you just put them together, they're super simple. Um, and it's growing every single day. And Google's putting more money into cloud now than they are some of their other products. I'm not sure if you've heard about this, but Maps, the Google Maps platform, is no longer its own standalone business unit. It's now rolled into cloud and it's being held under the umbrella of cloud. And all the money that has been going to advertising for Maps and so on, going to cloud now. Everything is going to cloud. Google is putting its best foot forward and uh, you probably read online. Diane Green will be stepping down. Someone from Oracle will be replacing her. and. They will be growing this very, very fast uh, going into the very near future. So with that being said, um, we can take you know, a 15 minute break if you'd like and we'll come back into the room, talk about security considerations as well as some really practical next steps to get that journey started if you're looking for cloud-based technology. Cool, thank you. So I know we said we'd try and end by six o'clock. Um, where is of hands, how many people need to be out the door by six? Nobody has to be out the door at six, that's fantastic. Okay, well then we're still gonna go to the tour afterwards. And we're gonna touch on this real quickly. So um, I don't wanna beat a dead horse. Everyone knows that security is the biggest concern when you're migrating to the cloud. You wanna make sure that it's watertight, nothing's gonna get in there. Um, other thing to know is that if you don't do it, if you do remain on premise, you're gonna end up most likely like Equifax. Not always because what happened in Equifax was user error, but living in the cloud is the first step to unlocking the, the watertight parameters you want around your infrastructure. And the reason for that, I'll skip this, is because Google recently released what's called LDAP. Is anyone familiar with that acronym? Awesome, it's actually the, the same technology that is used on this badge for me to get through the doors that I have. Uh, in this building, as well as um, the ways that we, we at Google, we allow ourselves to, to access different platforms like GCP, our Google G Suite instance, and so on, Salesforce, everything else, all controlled by LDAP. So um, this is, this is I have a mouse, I'd click the, the, magic access, the manage access link, but I don't. But um, this, is, this is something I think everyone should start looking at. If you're thinking about migrating to cloud and you're asking yourself, how do you differentiate between AWS and Azure, this is another differentiator, LDAP. Huge integration with a lot of different technology, great way to control your environment, um, and to make sure your users are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing and nothing else. From a back-end standpoint, you know, your engineers, your DevOps people, if you have them, hopefully not. Um, and if you, if you have end users that are leveraging like a platform that you built internally or users that uh, need single sign on that sort of thing, th that, that's all controlled by LDAP. <clears throat> Now, we're going to talk about my migration. The, the, the other thing that is a, as a question when you're moving to the cloud, if you're already on the cloud, let's say you're AWS, right? And this, this is kind of where you live. These are the three big moving blocks of AWS or, you know, Microsoft. Um, there's a lot of question as to where do you go and what connects to what. 
How does it work? How does it size up? Is it going to be optimized the same way, right? And so this is actually where I'd like to invite Mark on the stage, if he's you know, Mark here. Cool, to talk about cloud physics. The first step in looking at your reason or the way that you go into cloud is leveraging this tool set. So I'll hand over to Mark. Is this a clicker? Yep. Hey guys. So we're trying to get out of here in what, 10 minutes? All right, so this will be very quick. So some exciting stuff today about um, GCP. How do I get started? You're wondering, okay, I'm in AWS already. Uh, I've, I've got workloads, VMware on, you know, VMware Cloud IBM or VMware on, present, on premise or what have you. How do I get started? That's exactly where we, where we come in. Cloud physics, a little bit of background on us. First off, my name is Mark Spurlock. Nice to meet you. Um, I run sales and sales engineering for Cloud Physics. We're a company contracted by Google to enable a small subset of the uh, GCP partners. Dido is at the top of the list. Uh, we are a management and analytics platform for data center. We're a startup in Santa Clara, uh, California. We were founded by the same folks that uh, developed the core feature set for VMware. So that's our beginning. And quite a robust business as a management and analytics platform. Uh, but what we've done since we're a SaaS solution is we've created multiple uh, use cases, such as simulating your data center environment, wherever it may be, in GCP, in minutes, okay? So the idea here is, how do you get started? What we can do, uh, of, of, and all you need access to is uh, of, of either your VMware, VMware environment, um, of, or uh, uh, allow us access to, uh, or you create a role for us, read only of course within your AWS environment. And then in about 10 to 15 minutes, we'll present back to you what your environment looks like from a configured state. And then within, uh, if it's an AWS environment, it'll take 15 minutes to two hours, depending on how large, uh, to be able to present back to you, including performance data for the last seven days. And then for VMware environment, it'll take an additional 24 hours uh, for us to present back in uh, the, with uh, performance data. Um, so literally, in order to get started, you're, you're spinning up a V appliance in the VMware environment or you're creating a role within AWS, and it'll take you 15 minutes max. So this is how you get started. And what you'll be able to do then is you'll be able to slice and dice your environment any way that you would like to, by any way that you, you've logically defined your environment, by data center, by, by cluster, what have you. Um, by application, by any type of tagging that you have within either your, your VMware environment or your AWS environment, or you can create tags within Cloud Physics. And then, because of the data that we work with, so I went back, why was it important, uh, why we're a uh, management and analytics platform for data center? We're actually the most robust. So we work with the most granular data available in the industry. That's great for data center admin, our, our legacy uh, audience, but for you what this allows you to do, it allows you to understand what your environment costs and the most optimized view available in the industry in GCP. So 20 second granularity of data for your uh, uh, virtualized environment within VMware, uh, one minute granularity uh, of data within uh, AWS. So what that typically means is instead of, I'm working with spreadsheets, it's taking, or I'm running RV tools or something of the sort. Uh, it's taking me a month to pull this information. In minutes, you now have the ability to sort your environment based upon service levels, uh, five nines reliability, three nines reliability, two and a half, what have you. Um, instead of your configured state, and with that typically, or rather on average, uh, uh, equates to about a 40% reduction in cost to you for your workloads when you migrate them to P GCP. 40% reduction without additional discount, all right? So that's essentially what we enabled you to, you to do, to, to size your requirements within GCP based upon your utilized and consumed state versus your configured state. This making sense? Yes. Both. Okay. Yeah, exactly right. Both. Any other questions? 
So pretty simple. How to get started, talk to your friends at Dido and they will uh, introduce, uh, 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 they will invite you. You will receive an email with a URL. You click on it, you follow the wizard. Take you five to 10 minutes to spin up. If you need any assistance, there's a button there that says help. You click on it, we're there. Cloud Physics will be there to help you uh, spin up your, your uh, environment. Uh, and then sit back. You can uh, log in, your, your analytics will be immediately available, uh, or you can wait. Uh, typically, uh, Dido will circle back to you within seven days or so to review the assessment. The assessment automatically runs for 30 days. If you wish to go longer, you can. Now, we are a big data shop of, of I know a bit hackneyed, but we are the single largest data lake actually in the IT industry, focused exclusively upon IT infrastructure management. What that means to you is that if you leave us connected, this is all free of charge, absolutely zero charge for all this. If you leave us connected, migrating to cloud is a journey. So you can start with your first workloads, maybe a POC, a month later, two months later, you identify that worked out well. Now let's look at a couple more workloads that we would, actually, we would like to consider or an application. You might migrate that six months later, 12 months later. And as long as you're connected, whenever you log back in, you'll have that much historic data to work with. Understand exactly how your application or infrastructure is running. Completely free of charge. And that allows you to model it exactly as you need. Because there are predictive analytics as well that we've designed. Uh, uh, model it exactly as you would need for uh, your actual consumption as you will be in the cloud. Okay? So, free of charge, easy to start, hopefully very effective, um, and Diet has been a phenomenal partner for us to work with, so hopefully we all three get to work together. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Great, great, great. So, uh, this leads us on to the last part of the presentation. Um, we wanted to talk about brainstorming. We want to start answering some of your questions and whiteboarding, right? Whether you're a hybrid environment and you're, we want to meet you where you're at, whether you're using any of these technologies or other things. Uh, we want to also be there with you in that journey to containers, if that's something that's something you're considering. So all of this, you know, start thinking right now, start pondering what questions you want to ask us. These are some of the examples of how we can architect in the cloud, right? You got a, a web application, you have an IoT setup, you have something like live streaming, you have DR and application replication, uh, or you want a recommendation engine like Netflix, or fraud detection. Cool. Pick, well, pick. that concludes our, uh, our presentation. We're, we're very thankful that you came today. Thank you so much for, um, for learning, and we hope that you got something useful from this presentation. We will be, we'll be uh, issuing it out in a recording in a full format of how it took place today for you that showed up, and then those that did not show up will be breaking it out into chunks and delivering it via email. So if you have any questions, please issue them over to Randy, and that concludes the presentation today. Thank you. Great, thank you very much.